Neighborhoods in Transition, making Lexington more accessible, and the PGA Girls Junior Championship is almost here. This and more up next on this week's edition of Lexington Now. I'm Neil Noah and this is Lexington Now. No doubt about it, Lexington is a city that is growing and changing. And it's because of this that a new task force on neighborhoods in transition has been formed. Now people generally measure the quality of life in our city by the quality of life in their neighborhood, their very own neighborhood. And we know that each Lexington neighborhood is unique with unique concerns. This task force will focus on addressing many of those very concerns. In many neighborhoods, quality of life can include affordable housing, appropriate infill and redevelopment, and abandoned housing. And we are focusing a lot of attention and resources in these areas today. For example, through the Affordable Housing Trust Fund, the city has invested $11.3 million to leverage $86.6 million from our partners in the private sector. We have included almost 1,200, added almost 1,200 new or rehabilitated units, including apartments and single family homes. We've also encouraged private investment and developers who have literally changed the direction of entire neighborhoods in our cities. Areas like Jefferson Street, North Limestone, and the East End. So this is making progress. We know, too, that there's a lot more to do. Sometimes progress comes with pain, and sometimes we have to work on it. We have to work on it intentionally and deliberately. And that's what this task force will help us. It will help us raise the bar as we work to improve quality of life in every Lexington neighborhood. So this task force, which will be called the Task Force on Neighborhoods in Transition, I'm naming this morning with uh, Councilmember James Brown serving as chairperson. The purpose, as stated, is to identify ways to protect, to, to protect vulnerable residents from the consequences of neighborhood redevelopment and transformation, with an emphasis on preserving history and the culture of communities. So we all know, as the mayor has just pointed out, that growth brings many opportunities and many benefits, but it also brings challenges. And these challenges are not unique to Lexington. For example, we have seen where growth and development in other communities have resulted in making it unaffordable for the people who provide basic services to live there. We value our diversity, and we do not want to become one of those communities. So a little bit of background. As a general policy, we encourage both property maintenance and property improvement. On the one side, code enforcement uh, includes regulations that require property owners to uh, maintain and upkeep their properties. We've also worked for many years, a committee that was originally chaired actually by the mayor when he was vice mayor, that I chair now, the Infill and Redevelopment Committee, has worked for years to support incentives and simplified regulations to make infill and redevelopment easier to do. A little over a year ago, we created the Equitable Development Subcommittee of the Infill and Redevelopment Committee to look at the other side of the issue ways to mitigate the possible unintended negative consequences of that development. Now, we are creating a task force that will look at some of the same issues, but have a broader scope and a wider range of stakeholders. The task force will have diverse membership with long-standing interest and experience with the issue being addressed. Lexington is on the map. Our little city is growing in large part because of the leadership of Mayor Gray. Seems like every week we get mentioned in some magazine about a great place to live, a great place to raise our family, or a great place to start a business, which is great. We are a growing city, and we have committed to protect our precious rural landscape. And I feel that the formation of this task force is a step towards, as a step towards equal, equaling that commitment to protect our most urban and diverse neighborhoods. So I look forward to working on this issue with this group. I, I, I look forward to learning from other cities as they face some of the same challenges. 
And I would encourage participation from any and everybody in our community that is interested in this issue. Um, as we, as a community focused on infill, I feel local government has a responsibility to protect vulnerable residents and to promote equity in our neighborhoods as we experience growth and redevelopment. Thank you. Another task force that is active in Lexington is the ADA task force, whose goal is to make public spaces more accessible. Here are some of the areas that most need monitoring. My name is Jason Jones. I am the project coordinator for Kentucky Works at the University of Kentucky's Human Development Institute. I'm also the chairman of Lexington's ADA task force, the American with Disabilities Act. And I'm here today to talk to you about the top 10 inaccessible things that we find in Lexington um, that we need to check on often to make sure that our community is as accessible as possible. Um, and I'll just read off the list. First, um, sometimes we have doors that are too heavy to open. The rules should be five pounds of pressure or less. And the openers sometimes are not set correctly, which is something that we always need to work on. No landing at the top of a ramp. If you think about being on a ramp, trying to maneuver a door, pulling it towards you, if there's no flat spot to land on, it's obviously it's very difficult for someone with a disability to be able to open and maneuver that door. Uh, missing grab bars. Often in bathrooms and other places, it's very dangerous for there not to be grab bars. Sometimes they get damaged or they're not installed properly. Um, that's always an issue. Door width, particularly in bathrooms. The law says 36 inches clear. 40 is actually better, but 36 is within the law. Placement of toilet paper and soap dispensers. If you think of being in a chair and having to reach across a sink in order to access uh, soap dispensers or to be able to dry your hands, it's very dangerous and sometimes it's not reachable, period. So those need to be lowered. The placement of the light switch for the same reason, sometimes they're too high to maneuver. Missing curb cuts uh, on routes from parking, from parking lots. And sometimes we find things like a curb cut on one side of the road and not a matching curb cut on the other, so where you actually have to maneuver down a street, which obviously is very dangerous. Poor accessible parking, striping and signage, that's something that we've dealt with with the Mayor's Commission, and they're doing a lot of work um, in order to um, let businesses know that that's not okay and that we need to make sure that we have full spots with accessible unload zones that are not parked in. Block entryways and ramp access. You see this a lot of times inside restaurants and other businesses where they'll have something like um, a waiter's cart or something sitting on a ramp or some kind of stock or those kinds of things, boxes in the way. So we need to make sure we keep those entryways and those ramp access clear. And aisles in stores, at least 36 inches for the same reason, just to maneuver and to let everybody have an equal opportunity to enjoy what Lexington has to offer. So thank you. If you do see a place that has a possible violation, um, you can call the Human Rights Commission at 859-252-0071 as they are the enforcement arm of the ADA. And Lexington Parks and Recreation is doing its part to make parks more accessible too. Anessa Snowden talks to us about several features available that do just that. Good afternoon, my name is Anessa Snowden. I am the Recreation Manager Senior for Lexington Parks and Recreation. My phone number is 859-288-2928 and I'm here today to talk to you about accessible parks that we have within our Parks and Recreation system. We have several that are offered throughout the city and I'm here at Jacobson Park which is our newest accessible park. We also have a park which was the first accessible park at Mary Todd. We also have Idle Hour Park, Gainesway, Castlewood Park, which is where we hold one of our therapeutic recreation summer camps, and Shillito Park is up and coming. So we're going to be bringing new improved parks online that are inclusive, that are accessible, and barrier free for those that have disabilities. Our goal in Parks and Recreation is to provide fully inclusive playgrounds that everyone in the community can enjoy together. We have uh, wheelchair accessible um, paths of travel, we have access to the playgrounds that we have tried to make barrier free for our community. We also have uh, special swings for individuals uh, in wheelchairs or that have mobility impairments that may need um, extra support. We also have um, 
sway funds so that the wheelchair can actually go on and then it sways back and forth to give them the sense of being on a seesaw or a merry-go-round type situation. We have different types of swing platforms that they can get on. Also, um, we're really trying to be sensitive to those with sensory processing disorders that like to spin and do different things. So we're trying to add new innovative features to our playgrounds so that everyone can come together and enjoy our beautiful parks. They can recreate together and they can just get to be a kid. You can learn more on the city's parks page at LexingtonKY.gov. When we come back, the PGA's Girls Junior Championship is almost here. I'm Sergeant Randall Combs with the Lexington Police Traffic Unit. Accessible parking is a valuable and necessary resource for people with disabilities, and that includes the striped area next to accessible parking spots. These are access aisles, and it is illegal to park here, even if you have an accessible parking permit. Access aisles are necessary for me to get into my vehicle. They are there because many of us need that space to use our ramps or to transfer into a wheelchair. It's frustrating when a car is parked in the access aisle because I don't have room to get into my van. Police and Lexpark are writing tickets when they see vehicles parked in an access aisle and the fine is $250. Know where and where not to park. Keep the access aisles clear. Thank you and drive safe. Welcome back to the show. The PGA Girls Junior Championship is almost here and you can help make the event a success. Justin Mullenix, course pro at Kearney Hills, fills us in. Kearney Hill opened back in 1989. Um, we've hosted many, many uh, large events, everything from USGA national events, men's and women's pub links, to uh, the senior tour when this place first opened. And now we're uh, privileged to host the 2018 Girls Junior PGA Championship this year. Um, the golf course is in excellent condition. We got a lot of projects going on. We just finished uh, the construction of our retaining wall out there on the lake on 16 and got some fresh sod laid and everything's starting to come together for the spring. And like I said, we're just really excited about hosting the uh, 2018 Girls Junior PGA Championship. Yeah, we got 144 girls from all over uh, the United States plus five uh, other countries that'll be qualifying and qualifying starts this week. Um, so they'll be coming in here July 7th through the 12th, first two days of practice rounds. Um, and then the 9th through the 12th will obviously be the championship. And uh, those girls will be qualifying in every single state. And then like I said, those five countries and uh, we'll know by June 20th or so, the full field with their names and, and be ready to go and welcome them to the city of Lexington. We have hosted the PGA Junior Series event for probably almost 20 years. And that tour went away and the PGA decided that they were gonna offer a national event for boys and girls and do away with the tour. And um, through our relationship that we've built with the PGA and hosting the Senior Tour and the PGA Junior Series over the last 20 years, they wanted to keep it at some uh, venues that they had used in the past and we were lucky enough to be selected to host the girls this year. We need uh, a lot of volunteers and um, we have four different options for volunteers. You know, we're not asking for people to come out and sell merchandise. These are very interactive volunteer uh, positions. The biggest one we need are walking scores. 
Um, those walking scores will have a tablet or an iPad that they'll go out on the course with and they'll keep score for the girls. And that'll be relayed back to the Golf Channel on the scroll there on the bottom line 24-7. Uh, also online, plus all the live scoring that we'll have around the building. We also need marshals for the event, uh, marshals ball spotters that'll be on just about every hole. Um, we also need people to operate the big magnetic leader boards that you see uh, like when you're at the Masters, those old time scoreboards. We'll have, I think, six of them set up out here, so we're going to need people to operate those. And then we also need people to help with scoring control. They'll work hand in hand with the PGA. Um, checking scorecards, making sure things are entered correctly into computers. So we're looking for roughly about 100 people per day for the first two days of the championship and then the last two days on the Wednesday, Thursday. Um, that number goes down significantly because of the cut in the tournament. The best way to find, uh, to, to get the information to volunteer, if you go to playgolflex.com, there's a link on our website that'll take you to uh, the volunteer forms. You can also pick them up at any of our city golf courses, fill that out return it to any of the city golf shops or mail it to me here at Kearney Hill Golf Links or you can email it to me as well. The registration deadline is June 8th. Did you know there is a difference between a public garden and a park? Jackie Gallimore explains a few of these differences and fills us in on some of the upcoming events at the Arboretum. The Arboretum is a great place to visit during the summertime. We're open dawn till dusk and the visitor center is open every day of the week at various hours. And we have a lot of events going on during the summer. In June, we have our Junior Master Gardener Camp, which is June 11th through 15th. It's for years 8 to 12 and they basically use the Arboretum as a living learning lab, learn all about gardening and soil and it's a lot of fun. And we still have room in the June session to sign up. And then we also are having a 100 acre 5K for the first time ever at the Arboretum. It's June 23rd at 8 a.m. And you can sign up from, through John's uh, Run Walk Shop. And that's gonna be really fun. It's a 5K around alumni and through the Arboretum. And then there's gonna be a children's one mile as well. And all of those proceeds go to benefit the Kentucky Children's Garden. The most popular thing is the walk across Kentucky, which is the two mile loop that goes all around the Arboretum. And that features native plants of Kentucky from the different regions. And then we also have the home demonstration garden, which is right outside the visitor center. And it features different rooms that you can uh, kind of copy off of for your home garden. And it's just beautiful to walk through. And then we also have the Kentucky Children's Garden, which is open in the summer, Wednesday through Sunday. And it's a lot of fun. It's two acres designed just for kids and families. And uh, there's a wading stream, there's a fishing pond, there's a model train that runs at different times during the day. And we also do educational programming every day that we're open. The Arboretum is a public garden. The difference between a public garden and a park, there's several. Every plant that's placed here was placed here intentionally, either for education or for showing what you can do in your garden or for enjoyment. But for that reason, we want to show them a lot of respect. So we don't want to hang hammocks, for example, or pick flowers, uh, because we want to leave that stuff here for everybody. But also, some of the other differences are we actually conduct research here on the plants. And for example, the walk across Kentucky, all of the trees have actually been wild collected. So a person, our curator, actually went out to different places in Kentucky brought back seed or saplings, grew them for several years, and then planted them to conserve biodiversity. A park is purely for recreation, while a public garden uh, also does research and does educational programs. While we do encourage recreation here, and, and that's great that people are out here and enjoying it and um, maybe getting some sort of like peace out of it. The Arboretum's mission is education and research. So we can always use volunteers at the Arboretum. They help us uh, do a lot of things that we wouldn't be able to do without them. So in the Kentucky Children's Garden in particular, uh, they do everything from be a greeter at the gate to running the model trains to helping us with field trips and different events. And then we also have volunteers that help us on the grounds. So in the home demonstration garden, you can adopt a plot in the Rose Garden, or you can help work with our Walk Across Kentucky crew uh, to, every Thursday they meet in the morning to um, help maintain the walk across Kentucky. So it kind of depends on uh, what type of volunteering you're looking for, whether it be like working with plants or working with people or working with children, but there's all kinds of opportunities. 
It's a shorter week at City Hall due to the Memorial Day holiday, but we still have meeting coverage at Lex TV on Wednesday with the Rural Land Management Board. It will be live on Channel 185 and on our live stream. And you can find any televised meeting archived at LexingtonKY.gov slash LexTV or find our other programming here or on our YouTube channel, LexTV. That's all for this week. Keep up with us on social media and check out the latest traffic updates on Twitter at LexRex or catch our live traffic cams on LexingtonKY.gov. For the staff and producers at LexTV, I'm Neil Noah, and that's it for now.